Welcome to Municipal Affairs, the show dedicated to delving deep into the matters that shape municipalities from across Canada. Now, we are excited to bring you insightful stories, engaging discussions, and exclusive interviews with municipal leaders from coast to coast to coast. And we are back. After a week's hiatus, we are going full rural in today's episode. Today, we are going to be talking about the most recent rural municipalities of Alberta convention hosted in Edmonton, Alberta. We'll be having our exclusive one-on-one -on -one interview with Cara Westerlin, who secured her re-election bid for Vice President of RMA. We will then head into the bear pit, where municipal leaders grilled provincial cabinet ministers on the issues facing their communities. We will then chat with the Reeve of West Lock County, who put forward a motion and resolution at the RMA convention regarding the U.S. Administration's Inflation Reduction Act. Then finally, we will be chatting with Paul McLaughlin, President of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta, and Tyler Gandam, President of Alberta Municipalities, regarding the Intermunicipal Collaboration Frameworks and the new health care plans put forward by the Smith government. But first, on the second day of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta Convention in Edmonton, Brazo County Councillor Cara Westerland triumphed over Wheatland County Reeve Amber Link to retain her position as Vice President of RMA. Westerland, who was running for re-election, secured her re-election bid and then immediately sat down with me moments after her acceptance speech to talk about important issues. We discussed her victory, her vision for the coming term, and how having the backing of not only her council, but her family was crucial in running for a second term as vice president of RMA. Cara, thank you so much for doing this. Um, first off, congratulations on being re-elected vice president of RMA. What are you feeling right now? Um, you know, I am excited, but most of all, I'm humble. And um, I, I, I'm just so appreciative of our members and the continued support that they, they have given and that they have shown me. One of the big things that you talked about in your acceptance speech and in your speech as well is communication. Communication with the provincial government, to be uh, blunt, uh, particularly times of an emergency. Why is that so important for you over the next two years? Well, as I mentioned in my speech, we're seeing disasters happen, you know, periodically in the past and now it seems to be every season we're having those issues so um, that's why communication is going to be so important as we move forward in and making sure that we have people in the right areas at the right times fighting the right the right things whether it's floods whether it's the droughts whether it's the wildfires um, and making sure that we are all on the team together. I know we are municipal government and I know they're provincial government, but when disasters strike, it is so important that we are all playing on the same team and, and keeping Albertans and rural Albertans front and center of mind when we're doing that. Now, I just want to turn to the conference as a whole, if that's okay. We're on day two here. Um, we had day one of the ministerial forum. We had uh, me, uh, the uh, NDP. We had the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs uh, get up and speak. We had the resolution sessions. What are you taking from this uh, three-day conference so far? And what are you hearing from members about the strength that rural municipalities have going forward? Well, it, it has been said, and I know President Paul had made that comment, our message is being heard by the province. We know it is, but there's still much work to be done. We are getting that uh, the acknowledgement. We know we're one of the most well-respected, nonpartisan organizations um, in the province, and actually I'll be as humble as saying the entire country. Um, we have gained a lot of support uh, through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and our sister associations across, across Canada. Um, it's going to be interesting tomorrow. We have another ministerial forum coming up. It's going to be action-packed. There's a different slate of ministers coming in um, so the conversation will be really interesting we know that there's been several really big um, announcements made especially around health care um, it's interesting because it was something that I had touched on in my speech um, so it's good I know I know things are happening um, but I am the type of person uh, anybody that knows me personally uh, I'm a it should have been done yesterday kind of girl so uh, we're gonna hit the feet uh, hit the ground running um, and anything that we can do um, to to push the issues that we're having and and especially in the healthcare on the rural side of things uh where my sleeves are rolled up and we're ready to go what's your vision for the next two years for rma as vice president now because you you have a clear mandate you're moving into the well, not a clear mandate
yesterday because we don't know what the numbers are, but a mandate from the uh, delegates here to bring forward your vision for RMA. What do you see as your mission over the next two years as pres- a vice president of the organization? And you know, and, and this is where I'm probably going to uh, probably maybe take a 180 on you. Know, it, might, it might surprise you, um, but I, I guess I did mention it into my speech. And, and it's not so much um, the issues, the key issues that I brought forward. You know, it's about sitting down with our members. It's going to be sitting down and having those conversations and hearing their stories and being able to take those stories and take it to the next level and, and, and move it up. Um, it is so key and so important um, that we have. Um, the, the communication channels that we do have open with, with our rural municipalities, and we're so fortunate. Um, trust me, we're a bunch of folks. If we've got something to say, we're going to say it. You're going to hear about it. And um, and that's the thing that I, I hold near and dear to my heart is I, I'm doing this for my community, for my area, but I'm also doing it for rural Alberta. And that means all 69 rural municipalities and all those Albertans that live on that landscape too as well. The last question, and it's about the people you thanked in your acceptance speech, and particularly Brazo County. You made a special mention to each and every one of those councillors around the table. How important is it to have a good working relationship with your local council to be able to do this job because this job takes a lot of dedication and you can't always be front and center in Brazo County so you have to be dealing with all rural municipalities how important was it to have their backing to put your name for it again it is so important and so key. I have unanimous uh, consent from my ca- of council via motion. Um, if I don't have their support and if I don't have the for- support of my family, I would never be able to do this. So I, I, I thank them right away because, to be honest with you, I wouldn't be where I am today without that group of people that sit there. Um, you know, I always joke, we don't always agree. Sometimes we don't like each other. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we have each other's back. And that's so key and, and, and so important. And you touched on it. I was, you know, on average, I run over 160 days um, a year, um, generally doing many work and meetings for RMA, which takes me all over the province, all over Canada, and actually into the U.S. too as well. Um, so it's so key and so vital to have that support. And I am so incredibly fortunate that I have such an amazing council that backs me. And I cannot thank them enough. Cross Border Interviews invites you to join our show and share your passion for public service. We want to hear from you about your inspiring stories and insights on how you're making a difference in your community. Join us on Cross Border Interviews, where leaders from across Canada come together to discuss their communities, their commitment, and their service. Let your voice be heard and help inspire others to serve their communities as well. Contact us today and be part of the conversation. Together, we can build stronger, more connected communities. One of the major highlights for municipal leaders at these municipal conferences is the so-called bear pit, where they get to pose questions out in the open to provincial cabinet ministers regarding the issues facing their communities. Now, during the RMA convention, there were two sessions of the so-called bear pit, one on Wednesday and the other Thursday morning. Topics were ranging from insurance policies, childcare, ambulances, and Alberta's post-secondary education on the first day. Karina Williams Reeve of Northern Sunrise County got the bear pit underway with a question posed to Deputy Premier Mike Ellis regarding victim services units. Victim Services' current model in Alberta is recognised as the best in the country. How can you change the criminal justice system, the Canadian Victims' Bill of Rights, the Alberta Victims of Crime Act to fit your new design? This government's proposed redesigned zonal model is purely centralisation and regionalisation coming from top-heavy administrative tactics. Premier Smith is proposing decentralization of AHS. Why are you the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Services centralizing police-based victim services despite loud opposition of all Albertans? Thank you for the question. Quite simply uh, put, there are many many, uh, residents uh, and municipalities within Alberta that had no victim services, none whatsoever. And what we're trying to do is provide consistency throughout the province. There are some that have a great job and they do, do a wonderful, wonderful job at victim services. Obviously our larger municipalities um, 
Calgary Edmonton, just as an example, uh, they have a really um, full and integrated victim services. And then we have some smaller municipalities that do a fantastic job as well. But there are a lot of, more than, and I'm sorry, I don't have the exact number here, but there are a lot of municipalities that really have nothing. So we're trying to provide consistency. I say this in a lot of things that we do regarding policing. We need to have consistency throughout the province. The services that you get in, whether it be victim services, policing services, uh, anything related to public safety, emergency services, you should be getting the same service in northern Alberta as you get in southern Alberta, as you get in central Alberta, as you get in the large municipalities. It should not matter where you live. When somebody calls 911, somebody should show up. No matter where you live, somebody should have equal access to uh, assistance for, for, for victims of crime, for victims of trauma. Uh, all of these services, everyone should have the same service right throughout this province. Later in the afternoon, the Alberta NDP, who were also in attendance at the convention, gave a scrum to media who were in attendance. We asked the NDP about their views on victim services units and what the government should be doing regarding them. When we were in government, we did uh, receive some questions in terms of like victim services and whether it should be reviewed. And I think, uh, you know, we did a lot of work to figure out scope what the needs are and, and figure out what to do. I think the thing that we determined and like our move on it was to increase funding. Uh, because I think the very clear message was that what we need is more victim services. My my take on the changes that the UCP is making is that they're trying to do it to save money, to cut down on services, and that's why communities are upset, and they should be upset. Those victim service units do incredible work. A lot of them are volunteers. They get sent out in the middle of the night to take care of people who have been the victims of terrible violent crime, and I really think... Um, you know, this, this government claims it wants to be tough on crime, so it should be giving some consideration to the victims and to the support uh, that they need. And I think this is just, it's just another example of the UCP, uh, you know, cutting vital services that our communities rely on. Back in the bear pit, Clearwater County Deputy Reeve Jennifer Malhoff wanted to know how Advanced Education Minister Rajan Sani was going to deal with matching nurses with rural hospitals. It's my understanding we have the lowest match rates in the country, if not North America. What is your department doing to increase those match rates? And may I suggest that we also fill those classrooms considering we have some of some very short hospitals, including my own. Uh, my own hospital has been shut down almost 50 times in the last three months. I would love to get some physicians in there that actually want to do emergency medicine. Uh, perhaps we should fill those classrooms. May I suggest rural? I'm pretty sure we've got a lot of people that would love to sit in those classrooms. How, how about we help you find a solution for that? Hey, thank you. Jenny, where are you from? Clearwater County. Clearwater County. Okay, well, there are a number of initiatives in government underway right now. We're working with Northwest Polytech, with the City of Grand Prairie, as well as the University of Alberta to ensure that we can actually create some rural seats. And that same program is being replicated with the University of Lethbridge and the University of Calgary. So this is in my mandate letter. We've already announced an additional 300 seats for medical schools. But I know that more needs to be done, and certainly I will ask uh, the Minister of Immigration to elaborate a little bit on some of the immigration pathways that are in place to get more healthcare workers into the system. But I do concede your point that there's lots of people in rural Alberta, lots of young people who want to go to medicine, medical school, and uh, when they go to medical school, they tend to stay in their communities. So we have more initiatives underway, and I would just say stay tuned. For the Regional Municipality of Wood Buffalo, Councillor Jane Strode wanted to know if the province was going to support municipalities with flood and wildfire mitigation. We appreciate the disaster recovery program. However, we think it is a better use of tax dollars to proactively invest in community resiliency through flood and wildfire mitigation. In the past, there was the Alberta Community Resilience Program that supported flood mitigation. Can you tell me if the province is considering funding a program like that again? Similarly, when it comes to wildfire mitigation, will the province be investing additional dollars in fire smart, particularly after this last wildfire season? 
Thank you. Uh, okay. Mr. Ellis, if you don't mind starting, and I might have to chip in after that. So. Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Minister, and thank you very much for the question. Um, I will just say this. We have been working very collaboratively uh, with the, the federal government. Um, in fact, uh, um, tomorrow I have actually been summoned uh, to uh, speak at a, a committee on behalf of the, the Minister of uh, Defence. Uh, in, in regards to the collaborative relationship that we have had. But in regards uh, to the mitigation that you're talking about, not, not disagreeing with you, the federal government um, in their own admission has been, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, uh, maybe not as responsive in providing the necessary funding through, throughout Canada uh, in order to do preventative measures. Uh, that being said, we're always happy and willing to work with any municipality. Um, uh, I think uh, prevention, I always say, you know, we have education, prevention, intervention. Prevention is a key component when we're dealing with uh, possible and future natural disasters. So uh, certainly you have the commitment from this government to, to work with you uh, to see how we can prevent uh, further disasters in the future. And, and I would say that there has been an effort to be proactive. Uh, as you may know, uh, living in uh, Wood, Fort, Murray, Fort McMurray, Wood Buffalo, that uh, some of our disaster relief program is that we won't pay for a flood in the same place twice. And it's not that we don't want to pay, it's that I, don't, I think we could all agree it doesn't make sense to rebuild a home five, six times on the same spot if you know it's going to flood again and again and again. So some of our, our efforts have, had, have been to to be proactive so that if an area is that flood prone to kind of incent the homeowner to rebuild in some place that isn't flood prone, but your, uh, but your sentiment to be proactive is, uh, is a healthy one and thank you for that. Councillor Jennifer Lutz of Mountain View County wanted to know how the provincial government was going to help municipalities in training opportunities to approach the truth and reconciliation recommendations. Learn in lots and enjoy the opportunities to learn. Um, we farm east to Olds and um, we actually farm by a buffalo jump and that buffalo jump um, got put into a waste transfer station. So I've, I've got a bit of interest in protecting Indigenous um, relations. Looking for uh, learning opportunities and I sit on the um, uh, airshed board and Two weeks ago, we had the opportunity to take part in the uh, Provincial Indigenous Training Program. So it was a day and a half. And it was just the best training. And I know there's lots of resources online um, that you can take, but I think 16,000 people have taken that training, but you have to be a provincial employee or a member of the ABC. And my question is, is how could your ministry support municipalities in uh, training opportunities to uh, get smarter on TRC actions? Thank you. That's uh, reconciliation has become a, a big word out there. And I like to call it reconciliation. action and that our government's been really proactive in, uh, in uh, doing, uh, working with the Indigenous people and uh, I, I've heard that from other municipalities that they'd like to get in on that training so that's something that we are looking at. Uh, we, uh, we met with uh, WestJet uh, a couple years ago and uh, they had done a, a study of people uh, coming to Alberta from outside the country, from uh, Europe or whatever. One in three people wanted to have an Indigenous experience when they come to Alberta, it's huge. So we started uh, what I'm calling an Indigenous Tourism Corridor. We started another branch, you've got Alberta Tourism, now we've got Indigenous Tourism Alberta as well. And so we're working on uh, developing a corridor right, right through Alberta. So you go down to southern Alberta, you got head smashed in, you, everybody's heard of that, riding on stone. Uh, the Blackfoot Crossing, you come up to Calgary now, the, the Sam Museum, or the Museum, Gunbow Museum is doing an Indigenous uh, addition there. Fort Calgary is doing something, Fort Edmonton is doing something. Right at the ledge grounds we've got, uh, we've started a reconciliation garden. I was talking to somebody earlier about the Métis Crossing, we've got to work with them to create a hotel. Uh, some of the Métis communities, we've got uh, rodeo grounds going, Fort McMurray, we've got the cultural center. So there's, a, there's an opportunity for somebody to really get into the Indigenous tourism business and start, and start something right from one end of, the, of Alberta to the other. It's, it's going to be huge. And uh, I, I really like your idea of, of expanding our program, of uh, uh, getting that knowledge out there so that people understand better what... Uh, what our indigenous communities go through. And it, there's just quite a difference from one end of the province to the other. We've got, we go from the Blackfoot, uh, uh, Sutina, Stony Nakotas, the Cree, up to the Dene. And so 
people don't really realize the, the cultural differences. And so uh, th thanks for bringing that up. And well, that's a good idea. RMA President Paul McLaughlin, who was moderating the Bear Pit session with Municipal Affairs Minister Rick McIver, followed up with Councillor Lex's question, wanting to know what the province was doing to ensure that historical resource impact assessments wouldn't slow down investments in rural communities. As, as I look at our good friends of Willow Creek um, and a current resolution, so municipalities have expressed concerns with instances of historical resource impact assessments freezing development and resulting in loss of investment for companies and tax revenue for municipalities. Um, is your ministry considering a change to the process that will better consider or offset the financial impacts of historic resource designations? Thanks for that question. Yeah, that's some, uh, something that we're all always balancing. We're mindful of the importance of uh, balancing historical resource concerns uh, with property rights and economic interests. So I know I've got a few cases like that in front of me that my office is looking at, and we encourage anyone here that if they're dealing with something similar to, to reach out to us. We always want to find that balance between protecting our historic sites, uh, but making sure it's not impacting economic development. And there's usually ways that we can find around that, but make sure to all the people in the audience that if they're dealing with one in their area, that they please reach out to us. Now, one of the most unique questions on day one of the ministerial bear pit session came from Foothills County, and the deputy Reeve wanted to know why the provincial government supports and funds the United Nations and the World Economic Forum agenda being pushed down the throats of rural Albertans. Thank you, Rob Seward, Foothills County. My question is for all ministers. Uh, with the current uh, state of pushback against Ottawa and their fingers into Alberta, why is it that our provincial government uh, both supports and funds the United Nations and World Economic Forum agenda being pushed down the throats of rural Alberta? Using both funding and directives of the province, the Calgary Metropolitan Regional Board um, controls the entire Calgary region for development, create mountains of red tape, discourage investment, and create a regulatory environment that chases away both business and residential development. If this province truly wants to create homes, if they truly want to create business investment, then bring back the rural Alberta advantage, bring back local decision making, and get rid of the WEF controlled CMRB. Great. Well. I'm not aware that there's any budget line in Alberta's budget to, that uh, money goes to the World Economic Forum or the United Nations. I'm happy to be corrected on that, but I don't think I'm wrong on that. Um, more, uh, more respectfully pertinent is the uh, Calgary Regional Board, Metropolitan Regional Board. Uh, if you uh, listen, we they their job is to work together for uh, to organize and, and support development in the area. Uh, if there's, uh, that's, if you have issue, in particular files uh, that, that uh, they, you don't like the decisions on or you'd like us to look at, let me know. Um, but uh, let me say this, we encourage Calgary Metropolitan Regional Board, uh, the, the other regional board in the province and all municipalities to work with us. And, and part of this is on us too as the provincial government to get development done, uh, particularly now. When we're in a period where we need 130,000 more homes in the next 10 years above and beyond what we already think we'll, would get built anyways, we're going to need all hands on deck. And uh, everybody, including the Metropolitan Regional Boards, will be getting encouragement to uh, get development, proper development approved and done and built because uh, we have people coming here that are going to depend upon that. During the resolution portion of the RMA convention last week in Edmonton, Westlock County put forward a motion calling on the RMA to work collaboratively with the province and the federal government in addressing the challenges posed by the Inflation Reduction Act passed by U.S. President Joe Biden. In August of 2022, the United States government made a significant move by passing the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, this legislation estimated to offer a staggering $300 billion U.S. in tax credits, grants, and loans has sparked growing concerns within the Canadian agricultural sector, according to Westlock County. The act is designed to provide extensive support to various American industries, particularly the agricultural sector, effectively giving the U.S. farmers and ranchers a competitive advantage over their Canadian counterparts. 
the agricultural sector in Alberta, alongside the broader Canadian agricultural sector, has expressed deep apprehensions about the implications of the Act. This unease stems from the provisions within the Act that overwhelmingly favor American agricultural producers, placing Canadian producers at a significant disadvantage. Westlaw County's resolution, which passed with a staggering 77% of delegate support, called on the RMA to advocate for the province and the federal government to form a joint task force, including members from the RMA, industry, and agricultural groups to evaluate the Act's impact on Canadian producers and recommend policy adjustments to enhance the competitiveness, sustainability, and resilience of Alberta's agricultural sector. The implications of the Act on the Canadian agricultural sector are anticipated to have far-reaching consequences, potentially leading to significant corporate and personal tax losses for provincial and federal government, according to Westlock County. With the market dynamics now favoring American producers, the Canadian agricultural sector is poised to face substantial challenges, both in terms of market access and fair competition. Now, we caught up with Westlock County Reeve Christine Wheezy regarding this resolution. Reeve, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start with uh, where this resolution came from that Westlock County has put forward at the 2023 Fall Convention of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. So it was first brought to um, our Pemina Zone meeting in uh, September, um, and it passed at that zone meeting with unanimous consent, and uh, then as well as here passed, which was... Um, it's a it's a big privilege for me um, being an agricultural producer myself to be able to advocate for not just um, producers in my area but um, in in Alberta and in Canada um, in the last year since we've had the uh, inflation reduction act has been passed um, we've seen a lot of credits already being rolled out doubt that down there and uh, a lot of investment um, and a lot of uh, dollars uh, flowing across our borders that um, it's in, in these early days is actually terrifying. So we need immediate action. We need um, support and collaboration with uh, not just uh, the province, but with our country um, for our egg and energy industries. So. One of the big things that it was mentioned in the resolution was the agricultural community. Now, I know Westlaw County is quite uh, an agricultural resource uh, community. Um, were you hearing from ranchers, were you hearing from farmers about the need to play catch up in some sense to sort of catch up to what the Americans are doing in Canada has kind of dropped the ball on? Well, I think in our area, you know, as the Reeve that I am, I am in a position to be advocating for all of our producers. Um, being a producer myself, um, I think also in, in an area that we have uh, industry. I mean, we have seed plants, we have terminals, we have... So, um, and we're looking, all of us in Alberta, I think, are looking for, you know, economic development here. And um, I guess when you start looking into that and saying, well, why, what, what are we missing? Why, why aren't they coming? Um, and when you start seeing that um, these people are questioning coming here to Alberta because of the, the flash of this IRA happening in the, in the U.S., you know, um, we have to stand up and be aware of that. You know, we, we, we need to be able to have um, our own credits and policies and, uh, you know, we, we are um, in a province that is... Um, I mean, we, we are so diverse in all of our industries, and uh, this having this um, opportunity right now where we have like a great government that I think is really supportive of rural, the, um, this is the time to be pushing this forward and uh, gaining all of that, um, you know, global investments that, that they want us to get. We, we surely can do it. We can provide global investments, but we need support. We can't. 
we can't expect them to come here when they when we know they could go there for, and uh, receive more benefits. Now, your resolution did pass with over 77%. That is a, probably an overwhelming response from what you were not sure if you were expecting a number or not. But um, when you talk to delegates here at the convention, were you hearing people talking in favor of this? Because in your area, Lesser Slave River, you have Big, uh, Big Lakes County, they're very much agricultural producers as well. Were you hearing support not just inside your th- zone three district but from delegates across Alberta? Definitely, definitely. Um, again, going back to the fact that I think we are all, um, our, our government right now is very much pushing municipalities that's, that's, you know, giving us what they can, offering us to um, um, get investment. Let's build Alberta. But, you know, um, we need support. We need support in the ways that the Inflation Reduction Act is giving to our U.S. counterparts. You know, we, we need to be able to benefit in those, those ways as well. So you, the West Log Resolution asked for RMA to work collaboratively with the provincial government and the federal government. West Log County was represented by two MLAs and one MP, Shane Getson and uh, Glenn Van Dyke, plus also MP Arnold Viersen. Have you had conversations with them or are you in discussions with them along this uh, resolution path? Um, we have um, um, been able to notify them and um, uh, all three were notified um, that we were coming to RMA to um, present our resolution and now that it's passed you know I'm sure that we are, will continue to work with uh, collaboratively with um, all three of them um, to advocate for our industries here in Alberta. Join us on Municipal Affairs and let your brand shine where it matters most in the heart of local communities. Get in touch today and learn how you can make a meaningful impact on municipalities from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Your success is our mission, and together we can build stronger, thriving communities together. Reach out today. In a bid to tackle persistent challenges within the healthcare system in the province, Premier Daniel Smith and Health Minister Ariana Lagrange have tasked health officials within the province to undertake a comprehensive overhaul of how health care is provided to ensure that Albertans are receiving the best medical care in the country. Now, according to the province, despite ongoing efforts to reduce wait times and service disruptions, hurdles persist in accessing essential community care, including services of family doctors and local health facilities. Now, with a focus on delivering timely and efficient care, the planned reforms will center on key areas such as primary care, acute care, continuing care, and mental health and addictions. Now, last Thursday, Premier Smith laid out the reasons for the changes when speaking to the RMA conference in Edmonton. Now, you can see in yesterday morning's health care announcement that the entire health care system, from routine preventative care right up to life-saving surgeries, is hurting from delays. In rural settings, staffing shortages and centralized health bureaucracy, it uh, has a lack of awareness, which can often make matters worse. That's one reason why I appointed Martin Long as the Parliamentary Secretary for Rural Health. He's an excellent advocate for you, and he works with Health Minister Adriana Lagrange every day to ensure the health needs of your communities and your concerns are heard. We started our work to fix the province's health care system one year ago, and we were clear then that we were looking for smaller fixes in order to bring some immediate results. And we saw some progress, but we knew that there was more work to be done. So yesterday, we announced that we are refocusing the healthcare system to put, pa- to put patients and providers at the center where, be- where they belong. So the new, better integrated system will be built around four key priorities, primary care, acute care, continuing care, and mental health and addiction. This structure will ensure that each area gets the attention it deserves, uses staff more effectively, and allows more space for immediate decisions and responses to local conditions. Our goal is for the system to be adaptable. So if your community has specific acute needs in one specific area, the system will be able to shift to meet that local demand. And not because AHS has decided it, from on high, but because staff and healthcare decision makers in the region have the freedom to react and to respond. You're going to get more accountable, more flexible healthcare networks with no changes to public healthcare or, to, or any cuts to frontline services. And you're going to have more say. 
As part of this refocused healthcare system, we will rely on 12 regional advisory boards. They already exist, but we may repurpose them a little bit, as well as an Indigenous uh, board, an advisory council that will bring local perspectives and priorities forward. And it's no secret that we have seen, sadly, constant service disruptions and temporary closures at rural hospitals. Do know that as a government, we believe that's unacceptable. And it's one of the reasons why we are refocusing the entire system. Solutions should be determined by common sense, by conditions on the ground, and by what the people affected really need and what they want, not by wishful thinking or ideology. Now that is uh, as true. Oh, yeah, you can clap for that. I'll take it. <laughs> RMA President Paul McLaughlin said that he was apprehensive at first when hearing about the proposed change, but when he met with government officials prior to the announcement, he was impressed with what he heard. I'm actually uh, very optimistic about it. I think that uh, the key words were, were, that were said is they're recognizing the difference between rural health care delivery. Uh, they're, they're not regionalizing it. They're actually breaking it into what makes sense from a health continuum. Uh, the message that resonated with us, and you could see from our, even our, our conversations with ministers today and even through our resolutions, is they're wanting to ensure that the workforce is part of the solution making. That is what we learned, what we've been learning in, as individuals at the local level. And so I'm, I'm very optimistic about the, the approach to this. I was worried, uh, the rumors were that we were going to go back to the old regional model which had its own problems. Uh, so having this model uh, that's on the continuum that is local driven and dealing with the workforce conversation, I, I'm very actually optimistic about these changes made. I was very happy with it, I'll be honest with you. The president of Alberta municipalities, Wetaskiwin Mayor Tyler Gandum, said that he was encouraged by the news from Premier Smith and her government. Uh, I'm really encouraged to see that the provincial government recognized that health hasn't been functioning um, the way that it could be. Uh, there's been a, a lot of complaints about the level of service that we're getting from our healthcare system, and that's not to say that our healthcare professionals aren't doing the best that they can with what they have. Uh, so I'm encouraged that there's going to be some changes made and look forward to seeing how that improves our level of service. The intricate landscape of intermunicipal relations in Alberta has been brought to the forefront over the last two months. Now, according to the latest mandate, municipalities sharing a common boundary are now mandated to establish intergovernmental collaborative frameworks, except in the cases where they are part of the same growth management board. Meanwhile, municipalities without a common boundary can also partake in creating an ICF, inviting participation from Indigenous communities as well. Now, under the recent legislation, every framework is required to delineate services to benefiting residents in multiple municipalities, designate responsibilities authorities, chart out service deliveries and funding mechanisms, and establish a dispute resolution process. Now, additionally, the law mandates a periodic review of these frameworks every seven years, which means that municipalities and rural municipalities are about to undertake a comprehensive evaluation evaluation of their ICFs within a two-year time frame. Recent discussions at the Alberta Municipality Convention in September and the Rural Municipalities of Alberta Convention, which concluded last week, shed light on the intricacies and challenges associated with ICFs. Notably, the Alberta Municipalities Association passed a resolution at their September convention advocating for the government of Alberta explicit recognition of cost sharing for library services within the scope of ICFs. However, this proposition faced opposition from the rural municipalities of Alberta, which highlighted a recent ruling from the Court of King's Bench of Alberta upholding a ministerial order that excluded library services from the ICF between Cardston County and the town of Cardston. Now, in an exclusive interview with Paul McLaughlin, president of RMA, he emphasized the complexity of negotiating ICFs, emphasizing that the intricacies lie in the finer details. Well, we, and we both have agreed on one thing. It's the dev devil's always in the details. But what we've agreed on is determining what exactly are the basic services that should be in, a, in an ICF. That's, that sounds great. Yeah. We're going to sit and negotiate that. The problem is, is what should be in that bucket is probably where the contention is. But we're willing to work with them, and I think we're going to start having those discussions. We're seeing it from members on both sides. You're at the AB Munich conference, so it's the same conversation. Um, I think we need to know what's in the bucket. 
we need to think we need to know what's outside the bucket and expectations are high um, and you got to remember this is this flows one direction now the services flow the other direction but this does flow only one direction you don't often see money coming from a small urban or an urban out to the uh, the rural municipality so so it comes with complexities uh, words are everything definitions are everything but I think we're going to be able to get there one of the emerging resolutions today was about libraries yes. and I think that's probably going to be the big sticking point because that was talked about at Alberta municipalities as you just said that's correct um, are you looking at this con- as a library issue or as a municipal issue uh, I, it's actually I think it's a it's a municipal issue I think we do find libraries it does happen all the time and and that could be a one-off uh, I saw the debate at AB Munis and and so you could tell that people were saying, wait a minute, third party is is, is a difficulty because is that a basic service? And third party isn't really a basic service. So um, by my definition. So those were the negotiables come in. And I think that's a part of the conversation too as well. Tyler Gandam, president of Alberta Municipalities, who was in attendance at the RMA convention, spoke to us about the ICFs and how funding services like libraries can be a large expense for urban municipalities. I think it was important that our members spoke about the importance of what's being included in those ICFs and I recognize that RMA probably has a different position and they are looking after their membership the same way that Alberta municipalities will be looking after our membership. Um, I know that in my community in Wetaskiwin um, we do provide a lot of services uh, which include county residents coming into the city of Wetaskiwin and I think it's important that um, Some of that cost sharing happens with all of the users. Otherwise, it becomes a a large expense for the municipality to cover services that residents who don't pay taxes in Wetaskiwin are also using as well. Now, as the debate over the inclusion of services within ICFs continues to unfold over the next two years, municipal authorities are gearing up to navigate the nuanced challenges and intricacies associated with these frameworks, aiming to establish a robust collaborative mechanism that ensures effective service deliveries and fosters sustainable community development across Alberta. During the RMA convention, we caught up with past guests of the show and someone who was making sure the issues of her community were being heard by provincial leaders, but also by RMA board of directors. Clearwater County Deputy Reeve Jennifer Malhoff sat down with us on the second day of the convention to discuss what the convention meant for her and why she believes that rural communities do matter. Um, Deputy Reeve Malhoff, I want to start with sort of a generic question because we are at the Rural Municipalities of Alberta Conference. What's your general sense right now of how everything's going? Uh, We're on day two. Uh, We've just gone through the resolution periods. I know Clearwater County has put forward a few. What's your sense of how the members are feeling about some of the resolutions that you put forward? I think the membership really is positive with our resolutions that proved with the vote uh, that happened today. I think that they're very poignant. Police Advisory Council was promised to rural municipalities we're paying the bill we should be getting a voice at the table Uh, and the same to be said with with hospice funding Um, municipalities are ensuring that we are bridging the gap to make sure that the end of life care for our residents is taken care of Um, health care is a provincial responsibility they need to step up to the plate and take responsibility for the entire chain of life including end of life one of the big things that was the takeaway of the second day was the ministerial form, or should, should I say part one of the ministerial form. Um, now, you did ask some very poignant questions to Advance Education Minister Rajan Sani about nursings in your community. And at one point, you actually did say that there is a vacancy in your community because there is no nurses who come get educated in your community, then go back into urban centers. Why was that so important to put on the table and get the sort of minister to react to what you're talking about? I think it's important that we highlight all of the problems within the healthcare system, not just to the healthcare minister. Um, education and growing our own, raising our own is a huge piece of that puzzle. Yes, it takes four years to create um, a nurse, um, but we need to start now or four years from now, we could have had all of those nurses. So we need to start do that conversation now. My question regarding the internationally educated nurses, the IENs that is in um, Minister Shawnee's portfolio um, is in regards to the fact that we're getting these IENs within our communities. We are training them. We are taking time away from our patients or our nurses are taking time away from 
from their patients. And then these IENs, once they're trained up from my nurses, leave to the urban center that they wanted to be in in the first place. So put them there. Bring the one the IENs to our communities that truly want to be rural, that understand the rural lifestyle, that understand that we don't have the tra transportation networks or communities that they're looking for. Put them in the urban centers where they want to be in the first place. Did you get the answers you were looking for? Because I know we, traditionally with bear pit sessions, you don't traditionally get the full answer because there's usually the coined phrase, which it said a lot during the ministerial forum, sidebars. We'll have a sidebar with you. Were you happy with the responses that you got from the ministers that you did uh, pose questions to? Are we ever happy with the answers that we get <laughs> from the ministers that we pose questions to? I think more than anything, it's to, it, it is an opportunity to start the conversation. This is the beginning of that conversation, not the end. I hope that we can have those sidebar conversations and truly implement some of those things in our community uh, but we never get the answers we want in the bullpen session um, but I hope that it brings a focus for those ministers on rural and shows them that we are a part of this conversation and we are here to help and we can be a part of the solutions. What's your big takeaway from this week? That rural Alberta overall is willing to step up to the plate and willing to put in the work, but we need to work with the government, of, the government of Alberta alongside and be a partner in that conversation. And if they don't start, including us, we will, these bear pit sessions, these resolutions will reflect that. And now we turn our sights to by-elections that have been taking place over the last two weeks. On November 2nd, Arlie Young won the by-election in Bruderheim, Alberta for the vacant council position. Young beat Ryan Selkirk McIver by only two votes. In Nova Scotia, in the town of Westville, they went to the polls on November 4th to elect a new councillor to replace former councillor Megan Bragg, who passed away in July from cancer. Sarah McKinnon defeated three challengers to finish off Bragg's term. Now, on November 7th, Pitcher Butte, Alberta residents selected Crystal Neals as the new councillor for the community. Councillor-elect Neals defeated Mike Davies in the first election the community has seen for some years. In the 2021 municipal election, the entire council was acclaimed. In Cornac, Saskatchewan, voters almost evenly split among four candidates running for the by-election for council. Corbin Greenwood, though, came out on top victoriously with 77 votes, defeating three challengers. Now for upcoming by-elections. Later this evening, on November 13th, the city of Cambridge, Ontario, will elect a new councillor. Four candidates are vying for one position on council. This vacancy is due to the passing of Ward 1 councillor Donna Reed earlier this summer. On Tuesday, November 14th, voters in Hinton, Alberta, will be heading to the polls to elect a new council member and a new mayor. Earlier this fall, Mayor Marcel Michaels resigned to take the position of CAO in a community within Alberta. Brian LeBurge, who was a member of council, resigned his position on September 13th to run for the vacant mayoral position. He will be challenged by Nicholas Neeson. Two candidates are vying for the one position on council left by the resignation of Councillor LeBurge. We will have full details on both of these elections and all other elections that are upcoming on the Cross Border Interviews website moments after unofficial results become public. And that's all for today's Municipal Affairs Report for Monday, November 13th. We'd like to extend our heartfelt gratitude for all of those who have tuned in and watched. Your support means the world to us. Remember, our mission is to bring you the most important municipal stories from across Canada, and we can't do it without you. So please, keep these stories coming, share your municipal news, concerns, and even triumphs with us. Your engagement is what fuels our passion for shedding light on the issues that truly matter in our communities. Your voices are essential, and we're here to amplify them. Until then, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.